life is all about grabbing two pieces at once. <laughs> We are on the recording. Okay. Welcome to yet another episode. I think it's episode six, right? It is. This is episode six of Code Zoo with Andy and Keenan. Um, we've come a long way. Yeah, I am so excited to be back. Yeah. Yeah. So today we are covering somebody who is yet another Kalamazoo-gonian. That's how we say it, right? That's how we say it. Um, who is a major historical figure near and dear to my heart because of the specialty choice. This person was Kalamazoo's first neurosurgeon. And this may or may not surprise any of our listeners, but this person is an Upjohn. His name is Richard Upjohn Light. He was Kalamazoo's first neurosurgeon. He was one of Harvey Cushing's last students. He was a pilot who flew all around the world. He was a photographer. He was on the board of trustees at Upjohn. He was the president of Kalamazoo College. We could keep going, but that might take the rest of our podcast. So we'll outline some of his accolades and let you kind of paint the picture of how incredible this man's journey was in his lifetime. Getting into his upbringing a little bit, you know, Richard Light, so his grandfather is the OG, Dr. William Erasmus Upjohn, um, who we talked about in episode five, um, if you want more information about him. And his mother was Winifred Upjohn. Um, and so um, he was born during her first sh short marriage in 1902. And as part of the Light family, um, his father, uh, Rudolf Light was actually um, a psychiatrist, um, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, that's the specialty I'll be going into. And so his father joined Upjohn in 1907, uh, was a vice president around 1910, and then retired in 1930, um, and also served as mayor of Kalamazoo. So there's certainly some influence in his family in good social standing. When we look at, you know, his later years, um, I feel it really sets up the path that he took. You know, his education started early on in the Kalamazoo schools, but he ended up finishing his high school at Culver Military Academy. He then ended up going to Yale for his undergraduate degree, um, and he graduated in 1924. And just like his grandfather, he also enrolled at medical school at Ann Arbor. Now, uh, in his senior year of medical school, he took official flying lessons. Um, he also enlisted in the Army Air Corps after graduation. So he was getting out there and living life is what I'm saying. Yeah, this was, this is interesting to me because this was one of the times where he wasn't influenced by his environment, by the people he grew up around. But it was on his own accord, and I don't know, we, we'll see where it took him, but it, maybe it speaks more to his own intrinsic drive for what he loves than an extrinsic pressure to, to become somebody that his family tells him or expects him to become. After receiving his medical degree, um, he went on to Peter Bent Brigham Hospital um, to study neurosurgery with the Harvey Cushing, the father of neurosurgery here. <laughs> and so if you guys remember in episode four, um, we touched upon uh, Dr. Cushing and as well as William Bovey. And we shared a little bit about that and, and their impact on surgery. And so if you're interested in that, definitely check out episode four. Good plug. Second plug of the podcast today. Yeah, I think I'm getting better at that. <laughs> you know, Richard Light spoke at Dr. Cushing's birthdays and other celebrations with him. And something crazy happened. Yeah. Um, I don't know what's crazier. The fact that a Kalamazoo native was there for this moment, or the fact that Harvey Cushing removed his 2,000th brain tumor of his career 
and it was a major, major deal because he's the pioneer of nerve surgery, and it was it was uh, memorialized with a video of of this procedure, which is in the public for access, and the man behind that camera is Richard Upjohn Light. This what a moment, right, to be there. Yeah. Like, yeah, man, where hasn't he been? <laughs> and aside from all the crazy places he's been, you know, he had, uh, even when we consider his medical training, you know, quite the storied career. Uh, we see that, you know, he participated in Arthur Tracy Cabot Fellowship, which was a public health research fellowship at Harvard. Um, he was also an instructor at Yale and at the University of Rochester. And so, again, we see him uh, really thriving across uh, the different domains of his life, whether that's in medicine, whether that's outside. Um, and I find that inspiring. You know, he's able to live this well-rounded life and uh, really pursue every area of his life with that energy and that vitality. I think he does it well. He compartmentalizes it. Actually, um, when he's whatever he chooses to do, he does it a hundred and ten percent. So um, that doesn't mean that he wasn't thinking about it. So uh, actually, while he was at Yale, um, he was on, as an instructor. He was he was developing this idea of flying around the world, and in August of nineteen thirty four, he shipped off with with one person, his co pilot, who was his navigator. Um, his radio guy, uh, his name was Robert Wilson, and and they they went off for their five month trip around the world. Wow! To think about how you would plan where to stop in yeah. an age before you could Google best places to stop on my seriously. Worst there's no trip plane. advisor then. No, and this guy's got a five month sabbatical. <laughs> okay, here's a list. He went to Greenland. He went to Iceland. He went to the Faroe Islands, Netherlands, Denmark, Italy, Greece multiple countries in the Middle East, <laughs> India, the Philippines, and that's not even all of it. That Like, I just stopped, I was like, I'm going to bore the people with how many places he stopped <laughs> in this trip around the world. It's amazing. Um, and actually, part of his trip, he was the first American to fly into the Philippines. Mm. Nobody had done that before. Whoa. Yeah, and he's like, oh, I'll just do this part of my trip. <laughs> so... <laughs> So he finished the trip in 1935, published this book uh, titled Journal of a Seaplane Cruise Around the World, and they published it in 1937. Around the world is putting it lightly. (laughs) (laughs) You're going a lot of places. So anyways, he gets back in 1935. He meets a nice lady and gets married in the same year. And her name was Rachel Mary Upjohn, who is... W. E. Upjohn's granddaughter. V. O. G. William Upjohn's granddaughter. Wow. Okay. <sighs> Things got spicy. <laughs> Yet again, the Upjohn family tree is here <laughs> to spice up our podcast. <laughs> so they share the same grandfather, which means dun, 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 they were cousins. Yeah. Now, to, to make it nice, you know, they're like, they're distant cousins, you know. <laughs> right, right. They have to. Yeah. Um, but they're cousins. Not a huge deal. Apparently, when you're rich, you got you to gotta keep the wealth yeah. where the wealth belongs. Sure. I wouldn't know. But maybe one day, when we're rich from this podcast. <laughs> she, they got married in 1935. And... In that following year, they planned their, a trip of their own. So mm-hmm. in 1937, two years after his first round-the-world trip, they planned a trip through the Americas and, and into Africa together. Whoa, so how the newly wed, Yeah, what a way to test your new marriage. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so it was cut short because uh, I think a hangar collapsed on their plane. Not while they were in it, but, but it collapsed and destroyed their plane. But this one was significant because they took tons of photographs and it was actually like a geographical treasure because it was parts of Africa that were uncharted. 
And so they published a book called The Focus on Africa in 1941, a couple years after they finished their trip. It was such important work that colleges for many years after the publication of this book were using it as for their college curriculum. Um, That's and super neat. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. <laughs> this humble old guy who just yeah. travels around the world taking photos. They get back from this trip. They write their book. And he says, I basically kind of scratched the itch for a flight and I'm done. I've seen what I need to see. I need to get down to the business of surgery. And he jumped right in. In fact, he started before he even went on his trip with his wife to Africa. Let's see. In 1936, he had started his neurosurgery practice in Borges. If you think back to our episode one, now I'm, I'm pulling in Andy and plugging episode one here. Yeah. We talk about Homer Stryker and um, the uprising of the Stryker Corporation. Mm-hmm. He was doing so much starting around the same time, 1936-ish. Right. Are you telling me there's overlap here? There has to be. Oh, my gosh. And, okay, for coming to the future, coming to now, it makes me think Stryker is most well-known for its orthopedic instrumentation and its neurosurgical instrumentation. Right. Were these guys in cahoots? So Richard Upjohn Light had come to Kalamazoo, started his practice. Um, he was the first neurosurgeon in Kalamazoo. Mm-hmm. He was the first outpatient neurosurgical clinic in the state. Okay. Um, yeah. And he worked out of the fifth floor of Borges at the beginning of our third year. So near your our first rotations mm-hmm. was when they switched operating room floors to what we know is the big, beautiful Stryker Center in Borges. Yeah. Where it's these huge operating rooms, this fantastic yeah. center. Yep. But basically, like, the year before we got to our rotations, and every year prior, the fifth floor of Borges was where the operating rooms were. Mm. And if you've ever been up there, it's, like, tile walls. It's narrow hallways. It's, like, it's like old-fashioned what you would think of when you think old hospital building tiles that dr light stepped foot on yes is that what you're telling me that's where he began his neurosurgical practice oh man yeah <laughs> those are the same operating rooms that is pretty neat it is neat Oof. yeah yeah so he started his practice there and then kind of jumped into a bunch of other medical roles so probably before he left for his africa trip with his wife he was elected board of directors for Upjohn until 1968. Mm-hmm. He was asked to contribute uh, while part of the board of directors to a new hospital called Bronson Methodist Hospital. Mm, I think they, we know it. <laughs> they needed some funding, and Upjohn responded by saying, We need a committee to ensure that the creation of this hospital is going to be long lasting built on the right management principles mm. and, and has an appropriate plan for long-term success. And Light was appointed chairman of that committee and obviously was su- successful because that's where we're training now. Yeah, still here. Uh, yeah. So he was in, involved there. In the 1950s, the city of Kalamazoo decided we have a growing elderly population and we, we need to figure out how to take care of our, our senior citizens. They reached out to Light because of his travels overseas and his time in Stockholm. Mm. And they said, listen, we're going to appoint you president of something called the Senior Citizens Fund of Kalamazoo. And so he created residence uh, for supervised accommodations. Mm. What does that mean? Assisted living, as, ah. we, as we know it today. There we go. And he modeled it. They, they said it was like a carbon copy of, of how it was in Sweden. So interesting. Um, even though Sweden gets the credit, Light is the one who implemented assisted living in Kalamazoo. He was also the president of the American National Bank during World War II. Uh, and then finally, he was the chairman of the board at Kalamazoo College until 1974. He was the chairman when the school had its greatest period of growth. So they, at their worst, 
when he joined was at 360 students, which was abysmal for the times. Mm -hmm. When he retired in 1974, they had 1,400 students. The property went from a worth of two million to twenty one million dollars in value. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, and and they grew to a national prominence uh, with with their academic standards, and and so he was credited with that as well. Yeah, it sounds like he had a knack for administration. I think he did. Yeah, because he um, he kept on getting appointed to these leadership positions. Yeah. And he became leaders amongst the leaders. Not only was he the, on the board, but he became chairman of the board in multiple instances here. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if it had to do with what he experienced uh, with his surgical career. Well, I'm just wondering right now, okay, in light of all this, no pun intended, and, <laughs> and, and everything that he's done, how much surgery did he actually do? Yeah. <laughs> so... Obviously, his career wasn't Harvey Cushing's. He didn't remove 2,000 brain tumors. But he, he was productive. He had his own practice that he started and was successful. Mm -hmm. But the sad thing is that he had to retire pretty early. Huh. How come? He had a skin condition that prevented him from being able to scrub into surgeries. Oh, jeez. It was okay. a rash that just would like flare up and was too sensitive to... to abrasive soaps or something like that, but he couldn't scrub into surgeries, and so he couldn't perform surgeries. Yeah. Man, what a shame for that to develop after you've gone through all that training or in the middle of going through all that training. Right. Gosh. Yeah, and, and, and even even with the worldview that he had, he, he saw patients all over the world. Mm -hmm. And to be able to bring that knowledge to the States and to Kalamazoo, only to have that cut off. Yeah. When I think about all the training that we have to go through, it does feel a little bit disheartening to think that it, it could be cut short like that. Mm -hmm. He probably finished his training around uh, 1934. And so to have retired in 1946, he had a decade of experience mm -hmm. uh, when he wasn't flying, obviously. Sure. But still, 10 years for an experience under Harvey Cushing, uh, among other uh, you know people to train you. Right. Um, and, and then all the things that you've been able to see, is it, yeah, it seems short. Yeah. Especially as a surgeon, you know, you want to hone your skills. You, you want to do as much surgery as you possibly can. Yeah. It's, it's a short career. Yeah. But it didn't seem to stop him. No. So let me ask you this, then. When considering everything, you know, he's been through in his career, what do you feel like his legacy is? He's not necessarily credited with any one thing in particular, but he contributed to what is now kind of considered the beginnings of cardiac pacemaking. Mm -hmm. uh, he developed a device in animals to stimulate the nervous system huh. uh, with a remote control. So he was the developer of that. It was pretty early on while he was at Yale, mm -hmm. but sure. he developed kind of that that pioneering technology with remote control stimulation there. Yeah, there's some aspect of contribution there, you know, mm -hmm. all research kind of builds on itself. Definitely. The, um, the other thing that he is credited with is um, something called gel foam. Mm, okay, and, what's and that? A polymer matrix that absorbs up to like 45 to 50 times the, its own weight in blood. Um, and it's also coated with, with hemostatic products like fibrin and thrombin and those kinds of things that oh. can help the blood clot naturally. Fascinating. It's used so often in brain surgery because it doesn't require a significant amount of pressure, which you can't really afford to put pressure on the brain. Mm -hmm. And you can use it where you can't otherwise afford to use electrocautery, mm -hmm. like we talked about in the Bovi episode. You can just burn blood vessels closed. Right. But that's not always the safest or best thing for the patient when you're inside their brain and need to stop bleeding. <laughs> that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of seems like he took, you know, what Cushing and Bovey worked on and then took it one step further, thinking about the limitations of the Bovey knife. No matter what, he brought a lot of energy to his pursuits. And it's neat to see how that can pan out. And, and impact humanity for the better. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like at the end of his life, he you know came back home to Kalamazoo 
and he died at home on May 24th, 1994, of a heart attack. And it seems like, you know, him living this um, storied life of traveling the world and, and doing all these great things, uh, to me, it's, it's kind of poetic that he, like, comes back to his birthplace and, and does all these things to, you know, advance education or advance healthcare in the community and then ends up you know, spending the remainder of his time here. He could have planted his roots anywhere, especially as such a man of prominence. Yeah. But he came back home, probably to keep everything in the family, you know, when they all <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's probably where we will end up uh, wrapping this episode up and leave everybody with something to think about how someone from Kalamazoo can have such an incredible story um, that doesn't have to be an incredible story because of one track they followed or one accomplishment they achieved or one obsession they had, right? But someone who literally took every ounce of life and squeezed it for all it was worth. Makes me want to go out and seize the day. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. We leave you with that today. Thanks for listening. Um, we will uh, be following up soon with some more episodes here. But uh, we, we hope you guys enjoyed Richard Upjohn Life. See you guys next time. Ah. Hey, yeah.